coming up on Theater Talk. Put on your Sunday clothes, there's lots of world out there. Get out the brilliant teen and dime cigars. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm delighted to have, I think, my oldest friend <laughs> in the profession, as we say. Oh, Years ago when I was, uh, I think I was a freshman in college, and I grew up in Rochester, New York, and I went to uh, went home from a, a school break to Rochester to Jiva Theater, oh. and I saw a very fine play called Established Price. Um, a lot of very good actors in it. And at the very end, this little old man came in and stole the play out from all of the other actors who'd been <laughs> acting up a storm for two hours. And it was my Richard Seff, and I think I introduced myself to you. You did. And you complimented did. you. I was, I was your first fan. You were, and I became your first fan. When I started at Theater Week magazine. Absolutely. And you came in to write an article, I think, about Cheetah Rivera, and you walked yep. into my office, and I thought, my God, I know you from Established Price and Jiva Theater. Well, you changed my life because I had never written an article on theater or anything else, and now I'm a writer. You are, which brings you to Theater Talk because you uh, have a new book out, a novel called Take a Giant Step, A Romance in Radio, because you began as a radio actor. Too, and of course, you have another a me a memoir when you were on the show a few years ago, still in print, called Supporting Player, My Life Upon the Wicked Stage. Delighted to have my good friend Dick Seff back to Theater Talk. Thank you. I want to show you the power of Theater Talk. Oh, all right. Go, oh, please. Uh, <laughs> I, I will. Uh, Mary Louise Wilson and I and Christine Ebersole mm -hmm. shared that that uh, show of, of Theater Talk. Right, when you first came on, they when were the I, segment, I think. They were the segment year. before me. And Mary Louise Wilson has gone on to win the Richard Seff Award. Yes, the <laughs> prestigious Richard Seff Award at Actors' Equity. Yes. Antoinette Perry, Oscar, and the Richard Seff Award. Right. Yeah. And uh, the book, which is now six years old since it was published, is still selling slowly but consistently. And that's just because we were so powerfully effective on that program. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Word of mouth is spread. But uh, uh, I watched it, and it, 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 I don't look terribly different. <laughs> I just sound different. You both look better. Uh, thank you. I've aged, <laughs> but I've lost my voice <laughs> on oh, the no. way to the theater. Today. Well, but speaking of your voice, I mean, you have a terrific voice, always a great voice, because you began as a kid in the radio business, yep, as yep. a radio actor, and this book uh, takes us back to that time, uh, your radio days, if you will. Well, you might wonder why did I want to do that. The book is set in 1949, mm -hmm. indeed, in radio. And that's when you began? It really that's when I began, 48, 49, right after college. Now, I wrote, uh, this is something nobody knows, and I'm not sure I should say it, but I'm going to. In the summer of 1950, I was playing in, in Darkness at Noon on Broadway mm -hmm. with Claude Rains, the play closed in June, and I knew it was going to reopen in September on the road with Edward G. Robinson, and I was one of the actors they asked back to do the tour. And I'd never been on the road, so I said, sure. And I had the summer off with nothing to do, and I wasn't going to take any jobs because I had one in September. So I started to write this book, believe it or not, in the summer of 1950. <laughs> and the reason I did was I had just had a radio experience that was very important to me at the time. And I started with that and around it made up a, a story that was based on real life, but was fiction, kind of a romantic clip, because it included a character called Alice in the book who's really based on a lovely actress who was a dear friend of mine, Dolores Sutton. And we'd had adventures together as beginners in radio. Mm -hmm. So I started the book and I finished the book in the summer but I didn't know what to do with it. I'd never written a book. I didn't have an agent. I didn't know any publishers. And we went into rehearsal, and I went off on the road for nine months. And the book was in a little box. We, we used to type them on typewriters, remember them? <laughs> yes. And they went into a shoebox kind of thing in, in the closet. And I swear to you, with God is my judge, that book sat there until two years ago. That's 50 years. I just forgot about it. And you forgot about it completely. Didn't know what to do with it, where to put it, who to give it to. So it just remained as something I did as a learning process. And I was about to throw it out because I'm cleaning up my closets. <laughs> I read it, and I rather liked it. I thought, it's funny. 
only it's become a period piece. Right. In 1950, oh, it was much, a contemporary yeah. novel. Yeah, but right. <laughs> and rather a simple one. I thought, you know, this book has become so passe that it's absolutely it's in. avant-garde. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. All right, so but take so we us, got it published. But so but take us back to those to those radio days. I mean, what was it like being an actor in radio? Was it like what we see in the Woody Allen movie Radio Days? A little, yeah. a little, yeah. and it was fun because you didn't have to wear makeup. Right. You didn't really have to make rounds except to two or three buildings in New York, CBS, NBC, and ABC, and they had casting directors who would see you and you bring in your little tapes and things, recordings. And, uh, and then they had live auditions as well, six or eight months in advance, but still, you would get one. And eventually, you got calls to uh, be on certain programs. And I got lucky one day and, and landed a job on a soap that was running. What was the soap called? The Brighter Day. The, the what? The Brighter Day. The Brighter Day. And it was sponsored by one of those ivory soap things. Mm -hmm. And it had been on for a year or two when I got into it because uh, it was a running role that Jack Lemmon was playing a part called Bruce Bigby, <laughs> a, a young millionaire who was married to one of the girls in the story, the, the, the Dennis family. She was the sister of the leading lady. And I married uh, Althea Dennis. I took over for Jack Lemmon. You didn't have to worry about what I looked like. We right. sort of sounded alike. <laughs> and I was on it for several months when one day I came in. You never knew what the, where the story was going. And one day I came in and I went <coughs> uh, in the script. Yeah. And Althea said, Donnie, what's wrong? Have you got a cold again? I said, no, no, I'm fine. And I knew, <laughs> I knew they were going to kill me. <laughs> and of course, that's exactly what they did. <laughs> what did they have you die of? They had just some unnamed disease. <laughs> <laughs> it took three months to die. <laughs> and I have a recording on an LP. <laughs> Remember LPs? I have a recording, which I'm going to listen to tonight because I haven't heard it in 20 years. <laughs> but I'm uh, of my last day, the day I died. <laughs> But anyway, it did. What keep... sound effects did they make when you were you in the hospital bed or something? No, I breathed a lot, you know. <laughs> wheezed and <laughs> wheezed and breathed. <laughs> I expired very dignified, very in but a very dignified manner. Tell us though, what was it like? A sort of a rehearsal for a radio show? I mean, you had a director. They would oh, say, yes. "Dick, we want you." Edwin to Wolf. Like I remember he was about eighty, but a kindly gentleman. Yeah. What were the rehearsals like? I mean, would you read them through, and the director would say, I, 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 "Absolutely." I mean, there's no blocking, but they would no. say, I, "I want you to say it this no, way." No, they mostly talked in terms of stopwatches. Really? It's too long, we have to cut three words, you know. That was it. Because they had exactly a number of minutes before the commercial came on. And uh, it was very easy. You really came on, I think, a half an hour before the airtime. Mm. And did you memorize the scripts, or would you always just... Nope, never memorize. You read through them once or twice, but that's all. Mm. It was sort of embarrassing if you ever dropped it on the floor, <laughs> <laughs> which I did once. <laughs> <laughs> the rustling of leaves. But it wasn't live. Was it live when you were doing it? Do I don't remember. Radio? It had to be live. You'd probably know more about that. I know the first televisions that we did, which came from radio, of yes. course, in 1948-49, yeah. we began to do television in New York, all live, mm. truly live. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I t <laughs> there is one moment in my television career, my early career, which I have used, changed slightly, but not the facts in the book. Yeah. And that's when I landed a part on uh, One Man's Family, which was a big hit in radio. And then they made a television series out of it. And I was hired to play a, a, a date, a boyfriend, a young boyfriend of the very young Mercedes McCambridge. Oh, oh yeah. Who was, who was a, another great boy. Big radio, radio star. Yeah. And, um, and this was live. And I, <laughs> we decided to make me look a little older than I, I must have been all of 21. <laughs> to make me look 22, <laughs> they let me smoke. Oh. So I stood off in the wings uh, 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 to waiting for my entrance cue with the cigarette and I put it down. I didn't want to enter smoking, so I put it down. And as I was about to enter, I noticed that the curtains were on fire. <laughs> Literally, you know, the drapes around the door. Yes. <laughs> so I entered and said, uh, would you have some water? <laughs> The, the, the artist, Mark Dean, who illustrated the novel, yeah, yeah. has done a drawing in which it looks like it's Chicago burning down. <laughs> but it was a flame which you could smell and so see, and they're fanning and watering <laughs> all, all while we're going on with our dialogue. <laughs> that was live, live television. Well, you had to be really nimble and on your toes, though. With the... Well, you also had to be very young, which I was. <laughs> <laughs> you could, well, there, were, there were some older actors, mm -hmm. so that any time you got a job for $25, you were thrilled to death. 
because your rent was literally eighty-seven fifty. <laughs> that was like enough for a month's rent. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that um, that's all in there. And what and 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 uh, without giving too much away of uh, of the plot, though, I mean, this is. You take us through, you know, where radio is at its height, but then oh, it begins to. Oh, God, there were 30 million radio sets and about a half a million television sets. Did, care did careers end, though, as radio, um, as, as TV came into the being? Well, some I'm thinking, did. I'm thinking of the silent movie stars who Absolutely were wonderful until they had to speak, and then they were in the thing. career. They could it only, happened wonderful voices, but you put them in front of a camera and... They could only act from the neck up. So, yeah, some careers did end. However, <laughs> that was the first of my seven careers. <laughs> Careers. <laughs> yes, because you were also an agent. <laughs> well, and I've just been invited to join the outer critic circle. I'm now a critic, which is supposed Wonderful. to be the actor's worst enemy. So I never know quite how to behave. You hate anymore. yourself. You <laughs> give yourself a bad review. No, I'm a very, very compassionate critic. All right, it's a Take a Giant Step, a romance in radio by our good friend Richard Seth. Thanks for being our guest tonight. On Always Star. a great Thank pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> I won't send roses, and it ends, and roses suit you. So I saw that show. I think I'm the only one left in New York who can say that. <laughs> well, uh, those of you who watch Theater Talk, I'm sure you know that song. It is from Jerry Herman's uh, underappreciated show, Mac and Mabel, that really has one of the best scores of all time. And we are celebrating the music and lyrics of Jerry Herman tonight, are we not, Susan? That's very good, and we are with our guest, Fred Barton who is the leader of the 16-piece Fred Barton Orchestra, which is doing an evening celebrating Jerry Herman on Saturday, March 1st at the Michael Schimmel Center at Pace University. Fred, I want to ask you, uh, yeah. why, uh, why an evening of Jerry Herman? Are we celebrating something of Jerry's, or has he always been a particular favorite of yours? He's all of the above. He's always been a favorite of mine. You know, I saw Mac and Mabel when I was in high school, and it was put together by all of the same people who put together Hello, Dolly. Gower Champion, Gower Michael Champion, Stewart, David, David Merrick. Merrick. It was the, and Michael Stewart, who wrote the yep. book to Hello, Dolly. Fred has brought some uh, terrific performers who are with him uh, at his show coming up. Uh, you want to, I mean, can I introduce the first one? Oh, sure, absolutely. You cannot, I'm telling you, you cannot do anything about Hello, Dolly without Leroy Reams. He uh, directed Carol Channing in a number of revivals of the show. He is one of my favorite musical theater performers of all time. I saw him as a kid dancing on a quarter in 42nd Street. Oh, I Street. don't believe you. You were dancing <laughs> along with him. Everybody in the audience was dancing yeah, along right. with Leroy. That's how infectious this man is. So can we welcome to Theater Talk, Mr. Leroy Reams. <laughs> Come on up. All right, now take it away, Leroy. Yes. And don't disappoint, please, will you? So, Leroy, let's roll up our sleeves. We're going to give you a few songs from Hello, Dolly, with which Mr. Reams has a long association matched by none, except for maybe you know who. And it, this medley starts with some of the greatest chords ever written for the musical theater. Should we sh show them how it works? You bet. All right. Barnaby, you and I are going to New York. Out there, there's a world outside of Yonkers. Way out there, beyond this hick town, Barnaby. There's a slick town, Barnaby. Out there, full of shine of sparkle. Close your eyes and see it glisten, Barnaby. Listen, Barnaby. Put on your Sunday clothes. There's lots of world out there. Get out the brilliantine and dime cigars. We're gonna find adventure in the evening air. Girls in white and a perfume night where the lights are bright as the stars. Put on your Sunday clothes, we're gonna ride it through town. In one of those new horse-drawn open cars. We'll see the shows at Delmonico's and we'll close the town in a whirl. And we won't come home until 
the parade passes by I'm gonna go and taste Saturday's high life before the parade passes by I'm gonna get some life back into my life I'm ready to move out in front I've had enough of just passing by life with the rest of them with the best of them, I'm gonna hold my head up high. For I've got a goal again, I've got to drive again. I'm gonna feel my heart coming alive again before the parade passes by. Look at that crowd up ahead. Listen and hear that brass harmony. Look at that crowd up ahead. Pardon me if my old spirit is showing. All of those lights over there seem to be telling me where I'm going. But when the whistles blow and the cymbals crash and the sparklers light the sky, I'm gonna raise the roof. I'm gonna carry on. Give me an old trombone. Give me an old baton before the parade passes by. Woo! Yay! Now, my concert series is called American Showstoppers, and this refers not only to the songs. The songs have to stop the show. That's the rule. But the performers, I like people who stop shows. And so I called Clea Blackhurst. And thank God she said, yes, yeah, she's going to sing Jerry Herman on, at my concert. And here she is. Thank you. Hi, Clea. How are you? I'm good. That was very exciting. Yeah. I don't want to argue with Michael Riedel, but I saw uh, Leroy dancing at 42nd Street as well. And he was dancing on a dime. Just <laughs> for the record. Just for the record. I almost said dime. I know. <laughs> I, I, I can go back even further than that. I saw him in his first big New York job. I saw him in Oklahoma at Richard Rogers' personally supervised production of Oklahoma okay. in 1969. You're the real deal, Leroy. Yeah. Yes. So I've covered all of Leroy's career. Yes, and he's we pretty love well it. covered all of yep. mine. So one of the things I like to do, I do the hits and the concerts, but I also like to do songs that uh, are less well known. Because every songwriter writes songs that are less well known, that are every bit as good as the ones that happen to become known. And Jerry Herman wrote this song for Ethel Merman uh, when he was trying to get her to appear in Hello, Dolly. And she turned the show down for various reasons. So this song went out of the show. But he put it back in. Well, you, she was the final Dolly in the original Broadway run. I think uh, yeah. the seventh 
the seventh choice after 13 times asking her. And she finally said, when he, when he called this last time, she said, well, now that you got your previews out of the way, I'll come and I'll open your show. <laughs> the show been so, eight years or something like that. So they thought it would be, she had heard rumors that there were these two songs written for her. And she went down, Jerry Herman played them, she loved them, and she wanted them both in the show. And David Merrick saw that as a great new selling point for, uh, for the final nine month run, which at the time allowed it to break the record as, as the longest running Broadway show in history. But these songs have not been orchestrated since the original production and performed on a grand scale as we're going to do on March 1st. But we thought we'd give you a little taste of what one of these songs was. <laughs> I've sliced my slice of life a little thin, haven't I, Ephraim? I've been on the outside looking in, haven't I, Ephraim? Well, from now on, Ephraim, all that, it's going to change. The world is full of wonderful things, a bushel of wonderful things for me to believe in. So world, take me back. I want to be part of the human race again. And bid goodbye to all my trouble and tears. I've wasted so many odd years. It's time to get even. So, world, take me back. I want to let laughter light up my face again. No, no more. Peeking through the keyhole. Just sitting life out since heaven knows when. My step has a spring and a drive. I'm suddenly young and alive. You wonderful world, take me back again. The world is full of Aprils and Junes, red roses and yellow balloons for me to hang on to. So So that song uh, Jerry wrote for Ethel Merman, who, if I'm not mistaken, was going to do a Dolly originally, right? Before well, he Carol? wanted he wanted her to do it, right? And she had just come off of Gypsy and did the national tour of Gypsy. I think that's what made her think she just needed a break because she normally did not tour with her shows. Right. Gypsy, she made the exception. She she also never had a flop. So in her mind, it's like she would do the show, it would be a hit, 
she'd be stuck with it. You know what I mean? It didn't right, occur right, to her, right. like, will it work? <laughs> <laughs> but also, didn't you tell me, Leroy, that she yeah. also was tired of doing, she didn't get the movie The Gypsy, right? That's right. And, so she, when, and she said, you know, I put all the work into doing Broadway, and then I never get the film. And she just wanted to try something else. She just didn't want to make a commitment to a year or two of her life into something anymore. She and then have Barbara Streisand do that's the That's right. <laughs> Hello, Dolly. Yes. Yeah, precisely. So, all right. Uh, it is uh, Fred uh, Barton. Fred Barton, American Showstoppers, an evening of Jerry Herman, at March the, 1st. You, the what's Michael the Schimmel. Center at Pace University. And don't forget Clea's wonderful. Uh... Yeah, don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything make, make the sure traffic you take it will with allow. You, Michael. <laughs> I will. Uh, Enjoy. <laughs> All right, can you play us out with a little uh, something from Oh, Jeff? sure. How about. Um... Good night, good night. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>